Hello ladies and gentlemen and thank you to Nithep for inviting me to give a talk based on my PhD work. The title is A Bilocal Description of the Conformal Algebra at the Critical Point in Three Dimensions. Now Renee asked me to give a few inputs to students who might be in the middle of their postgraduate studies and I've got quite a bit to go through today. So I'm going to limit my inputs to the following. If I, as a mom of three children without a domestic, can do this, I'm sure all of you can. Awesome, so let's have a look at the outline for today. We're going to start with a motivation where we just describe what the vector model higher spin duality is. We're going to have a look at some background information, take a look at the Hamiltonian formalism, take a look at temporal gauge, um, and we're going to describe the bulk construction and end off with the bulk conformal algebra with the highlight being finding the bulk conformal algebra at the infrared fixed point. We'll then move on to some conclusions, an outlook and some open questions and acknowledgements. Now, I just want to highlight that there's lots of information um, that's hidden within this presentation. So if you don't understand everything immediately, don't worry about it. You can just reach out to me. Um, my email is on this presentation and feel free to ask me any questions. So let's have a look at what the ADS CFT correspondence is. It's something very special that one Maldesena actually came up with, and it's it helps us to understand gravitational theories as a duality to conformal field theories, so that where calculations might be hard in one context because of a high a large coupling, they become simpler in the other context and vice versa. Now, if you just have a look at this table you'll notice that there are different ways of probing this correspondence. And the one on the right hand side is between the ON vector models in three dimensions and Vasiliev higher spin theories. Now this is considered one of the easier way, ways of um, probing this correspondence. Um, so we're going to have a look at it. It's not, it's not easy, but it's one of the easier ways of doing it. So let's have a look. Why would we think about using this duality? Well, vector models are, in inverted commas, solvable in the large n limit and allow a more detailed study of ADS-CFT. And then the second point is quite an important point, is that there's been quite a bit of evidence for this conjecture over the last few years in the form of the matching of the tree-level three-point functions, the free level, the free energy at one loop on the three sphere, as well as the reconstruction of the bulk. So what is it? What are the salient points that we want to highlight throughout this presentation? Well, they are the items that came out of Klebanov and Polyakov's paper in 2002. So the first is that the free 3D ON vector model is dual to type A minimal Vasiliev higher spin gauge theory with boundary conditions such that delta equals one. Secondly, the critical 3D ON vector model is dual to type A minimal Vasiliev higher spin theory with boundary conditions such that delta equals two. And the third point is that in the presence of a relevant interaction, the theory flows from an unstable UV fixed point with scalar operator of dimension delta equals to one to an IR fixed point with scalar operator of delta equals to two. So let's just have a look at a bit of the tools that we're going to use. So on the ON vector side of things, we're going to use what is known as the collective field theory, which was um, described by Yavitsky and Sakita in 1980. And it explicitly encodes the variance of a theory. Um, in our case, we're going to be using by locals. But what collective field theory really just involves is a change of variables, then describing the kinetic term in terms of this change of variables, then using a similarity relation. And when we input this, we, we get a whole expression. And then we require hermeticity, which gives us a certain expression. And from that, we're able to determine what the Jacobian should look like. Now, on the higher spin side of things, in order to build up a higher spin theory, there are certain no-go theorems. Now, if we were to work in a flat space time, and that means that we've got an S matrix, 
here are the following no-go theorems. Firstly, the only conserved quantities in the mass gap containing theory, apart from the generators of the Poincaré group, are Lorentz scalars. So that means that if we were to try and um, figure out the internal symmetries and link them with the space-time symmetries, we'd only get trivial interactions. Secondly, the only particles able to produce long-range interactions are scalars, vectors, and one spin-2 particle. And this is the, uh, a Weinberg no-go theorem. And then from the Weinberg-Witten theorem, we've got that a theory allowing a Lorentz covariant conserved four vector, four current, can't contain massless particles of spin j bigger than a half, since the corresponding conserved charge would vanish. And secondly, a theory allowing a Lorentz covariant conserved energy momentum tensor from which an energy momentum four vector may be constructed can't contain massless particles of spin j bigger than one. So if we work in a flat space time, we've got a problem with these no-go theorems. So the way to circumvent it then is to work on a curved space time. And that's where the whole ADS idea comes in quite handy. So let's have a look at the Hamiltonian formalism. So firstly, we're going to look at equal time by locals. The ON singlet sector can be described by the equal time by locals given over there. And we have that x1 and x2 are two-dimensional vectors. Remember, we're working in conformal field theory um, in three dimensions. So it's a time plus two space dimensions for each of them. So the expression for psi then has five degrees of freedom. And their conjug conjugate momenta are then mapped in the UV to ADS4 cross S1. So the five degrees of freedom match on either side. And this map has then been generalized to the temporal gauge in the 2015 paper by those authors over there. So let's have a look at what the map looks like in this free case. So on the left hand side, we've got the ADS coordinates. And on the right hand side, we've got my local coordinates. Notice the time coordinate is trivial. So we've just got four equations. Um, and then those are all obviously in momentum space. And just notice that the holographic direction is given by Z, and that comes out explicitly in this map. So let's have a look at the collective Hamiltonian. That's what we're going to be using in, in this research. So we get the top expression for the collective Hamiltonian. We then obtain 1 over n corrections and study the spectrum of fluctuations about the large inconformal background. And from that, we're able to get a quadratic Hamiltonian. So just notice the last term in the bottom line is an integral d squared vector x, e to squared xx. So that's our um, interaction term that we, we're going to look at a little bit. Let's have a look now. Something very special happens. Um, so first of all, from that equation, we get an eigenvalue equation. And then at the IR fixed point, We've got two things that happen. The inverse of psi naught becomes 1 over 2 mod k, and lambda goes to infinity. And what's quite exciting is that the full solution to our potential scattering problem then takes on a finite form. So now if we do the calculation as lambda turns to infinity, we actually find that that e to xx term that we found in the interaction of our quadratic Hamiltonian um, actually goes to zero. And so this is a result that Maloque and Rodrigues um, proved in, in 2018, that the delta equals to one state is removed from the spectrum, which is absolutely in agreement with what Klebanov and Polyakov came up with in 2002. So now let's have a look. Um, there's another equation that also gets satisfied, and this is now the bound state equation. So we see it's not zero. We've got this nice bound state equation, um, which yeah we will also be using later. So now let's have a look at temporal gauge. Now, if we just follow the Noether procedure and we're using three dimensions, we're able to come up with the following generators. And... Furthermore, we're going to have a look 
at the map, so the map that we saw earlier between ADS and the conformal field theories, can also be established using a kernel. Now this kernel, which is the um, calligraphic K, is simply given by a whole bunch of delta functions which impose this, um, this map and multiplied by a Jacobian. Now what's quite nice is that just this Jacobian simplifies nicely to 1 over mod K1 plus mod over 1 over mod K2. So that's also quite um, an interesting thing which, which comes into play later on. Now using this kernel induced map we find that the generators become as follows. So we get all of those um, generators coming out. Um, and now let's take a look at our quadratic Hamiltonian. So now what's, what is our aim? We're trying to look at what this quadratic Hamiltonian is going to look like in the ADS coordinates instead of um, integrating over by local coordinates. So, so notice we've got a, a Jacobian-like term that just seems to pop up everywhere. So the, we get certain equations of motion, and from that we can immediately obtain the time um, um, coordinate of the momentum, which is P0, um, which is literally just the sum of the energies if there were two particles. And then we've got in ADS an on-shell condition which is equivalent to that, the um, square root of mod k squared plus kz squared. So let's take a look at a few salient points here. So once again, we've got that Jacobian. And if we have a look at the commutators, we find that that Jacobian also comes into play. And so we've got the commutator of um, the pi and the eta divided by that Jacobian gives us the relevant delta function in ADS coordinates. And so that leads us to the idea of let's, let's perform a, a redefinition of our fields. So we've got this, um, this calligraphic H, which is just the eta redefined, and the capital pi is simply the same as the previous pi. And what happens then is that the quadratic Hamiltonian simplifies, as you see there, and we can write it as an integral of P0 multiplied by this combination of creation and annihilation operators. Now we may expand the universal and criti or critical scattering state in the energy eigenstate as follows. So you see we've got an eta vector k1, vector k2. Now we're going to change to the highest spin variables and make the identification as seen in the bottom there. And if we simplify that expression, we get this expression h of kappa vector. And that's what it's given by now. If we just use a few mild assumptions, so mod of pz goes to, um, as mod of pz goes to infinity, we require certain um, behaviors and we require to be even, then we get that that integral simplifies to i pi h of our ADS coordinates. Um, and just notice that the theta, that's the parameter for our S1 um, that we saw in the ADS4 cross S1. So that's where the theta comes from. And as a result, we find that this H, our field, then simplifies just to an a, a little h minus 1 over pi integral from 0 to pi d theta h of our ADS coordinates. And now we're going to use the idea of higher spin theories. Now, in higher spin theories, we generally have a whole sum of um, an infinite tower of, of terms involving um, our higher spin values. So... Here we use h as the sum from s is 0 to infinity of cos of s theta multiplied by hs of our ADS coordinates. Um, and what we notice is that the latter term of our capital H expression removes the s equals 0 term. Now, why is that interesting? Well, delta that we were thinking of earlier when we were explaining Klebanov and Polyakov, 
um, is simply s plus 1. So if we're removing the s equals 0 state in our field, it's the same as removing the delta equals to 1 state. So this is pretty much the analog of when we had eta um, disappearing at the i of x point. So that's amazing. And this also then gives credibility to the identification um, that we made of the redefinition of the fields. So we've also then got that the interacting field may be written um, as that. And now we can find all of our conformal generators that we had for the free theory. We can write these in terms of our redefined variables. So once again, we've got them in terms of a combination of the annihilation and creation operators over here. So now, at the IR fixed point, so all that we've been doing up until now has been in the free theory. But now, at the IR fixed point, we make a few observations. Firstly, we find that the interaction term lambda on 4 factorial, the integral d to the d minus 2 vector x of e to x x squared, doesn't contribute to the Hamiltonian or the potential. That's what we've been saying. Secondly, we've got that the scattering state of the system correspond to the removal of the s equals 0 or delta equals to 1 spin in the bulk. So from this, we may write each of the free generators as a sum of an infinite tower of spins as follows. So we had our free expression, but now we can write it as a higher spin looking expression. And we can do that for all of these as follows. And the awesome part here is in order to get the generators for the interacting theory, all we need to do is remove the s equals zero contribution. And then we get the, the generators at the critical point. So in conclusion, what have we done? We have been able to find the explicit form of the map between ADS4 cross S1 and CFT3 in the interacting case using the Hamiltonian approach in temporal gauge. Secondly, we found that the, the cortic interaction contributes linearly in the bilocal field fluctuation equations, and so the spectrum problem is just that of a potential scattering problem. So remember, we had our scattering states, we had our bound states. Thirdly, the scattering state solutions take a universal form at the critical point. So as lambda tends to infinity, we get um, a finite form, which is quite incredible. Fourthly, we've got that the bulk description of these boundary scattering states was obtained by developing a first principles approach consisting of a simple change of variables from by local momenta to bulk momenta as dictated by the map, but requiring a field redefinition in defining the bulk higher spin field. And that's how the redefinition looked. And remarkably, it was shown in the bulk that the s equals zero state equivalent to the delta equals s plus one equals one state is precisely removed from the bulk higher spin field, which is equivalent to what we found in the Klebanov polyakov paper in 2002, as well as what was found by Malokwe and Rodriguez in 2018 where they studied correlators in the spectrum on the boundary. And lastly, the conformal algebra in bulk coordinates was then shown to agree with that obtained previously in the paper by, 20, by Demela Koch, Javitsky, Yin, and Rodriguez and Yoon in 2015, um, both at the free and interacting critical point, which then established the equivalence of our approach with that developed um, in this 2015 paper. Now, um, as part of the outlook, I think one of the most exciting points was in the earlier stage of this research, we set out to establish or convince ourselves of the completeness and orthogonality of energy eigenstates um, or eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian in the boundary. 
And this was done using the collective field theory with by local specified in X space. However, despite the many attempts, I think we spent about a year, this could not be achieved in a consistent manner. However, by making use of the map, we were indeed able to find the exact eigenstates in the bulk. So this leads us to the question, if we were to start with the states in the bulk and perform the change back to the boundary, we should find that the, the completeness and orthonormality was missing some weight functions. Um, and this might link with the work done by Domenico Koch, Yavitsky, Suzuki, and Yun in 2018, and could explain the leg factors that were introduced in the discussion about conformal partial waves in collective field theory in the context of higher spins. Now, there are still some open questions that, we, that are there to be considered. So we've not examined the map for space coordinate changes. So the previously established momentum coordinate map yielded, for example, x1, x2, z in terms of these momentum variables. Does the field redefinition introduced change these identifications? So for this, we would need to investigate the full phase space map. Secondly, if the momentum dependence in the space coordinates is still present, is the new form consistent with it still being a canonical space transformation? So much of the work leading up to this was based on the idea that it's a canonical transformation. Is it still consistent? And another open question. So we considered only the quadratic Hamiltonian. However, one could now consider making use of the redefinition and change of variables for the cubic Hamiltonian. This is still an open problem. For example, Vasiliev's higher spin theory has a very large symmetry, and the issue of a gauge fixed three-point function derived from this theory has not yet been fully understood. And there has been some progress in this department using light cone gauge by Metsayev in 2018, 2019, and another 2019 paper. One could then also look at applying the principles described in this presentation to other higher point vertices. So thank you very much to Professor Rodriguez, to Dr. Malokwe, as well as to Nithik for providing funding for this. Thank you all for listening and have a wonderful day further.